Hey, folks there at YouTube, part of the uh, Flight Sim crew. This is your pilot in command, Ryan. And I've got a bit of a different video for you all today. I've got a guest with me, and we're going to be covering just a few topics. We're going to talk about the ships that have been sunk in the conflict in, um, overseas in Ukraine, uh, the brain drain being experienced by the Russian side, um, some of the great news sources that I have found that I want to bring to you all for uh, on-the-fly information as things transpire. And we're going to talk about uh, the future of NATO. So buckle up, folks, and keep your uh, seats firmly in place. We are going to take off from here. We're going to be leaving from Odessa. And um, we're going to just be discussing some of the topics today. So uh, do you want to introduce yourself? All right. Welcome to Flight Sim Crew. My name is Riley O'Quinn, and I am uh, just the guest on this. Uh, with Ryan, we're going to be going over May 3rd. I think that's where we're starting at is an update on Ukraine from May 3rd. So what do we got, Ryan? Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Well, yes, this update is effective as of May 3rd of 2020. As you all may know, uh, the situation in Ukraine is ever evolving. So this is this is moving at the speed of light. I just wanted to get kind of a little bit of an update video to kind of bring you all up. We're two months into this conflict. And I just wanted to kind of have a little bit of a pulse check on what's going on over there. And um, so, yeah, let's start off um, just talking about the, uh, the ships that have been sunk. So, Riley, are you familiar with the, um, the flagship that was sunk in the Black Sea? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there, it was the Russian flagship. It's about a 600-foot vessel. Um, it housed apparently around 500 sailors, mm -hmm. um, and it held 16 uh, long-range cruise missiles, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. But its primary, primary uh, uh, reason was to be uh, air defense. Uh, that was sunk. That's got to be a huge blow. We already know it's a huge blow. Um, uh, and a great, uh, great, some great moral uh, victory for Ukraine and really NATO as well um, in long term. Well, yes, absolutely. I want to dovetail off that. The, um, the absolute um, uh, mor morale victory here. So the, the fact that they took down a flagship and the fact they took it out down with two relatively new to the Ukraine but relatively cheap to make missiles. So I've seen some simulations done by some people that have uh, that use really high-end software to do military simulations. And it should have taken like eight or nine of these to overwhelm the point defense system of the Russian flagship. So this flagship, had they been at, at full alert, had they actually been paying attention to their systems, they should have taken out these two with, with you know, moot point, no news, yeah, you know? Yeah, and this is, this is a problem that we are, are seeing regularly in the Russian forces is that they seem to be asleep at the wheel quite often, um, and, and they seem to have a, a lot of issues uh, with upholding command and, uh, and keeping their soldiers alert at all times. They seem to be quite like a ragtag group of people, which was not what we expected. Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, before this war began, we thought this was just going to be steamrolled, and uh, they've shown us quite the opposite. They have, and I like that you brought up there asleep at the wheel because most simulations that I have seen, um, they actually de they, they don't believe that the Ukrainians were actually flying a drone to quote, distract the ship because in doing so, and I like this argument, in doing so, uh, if you had a drone, an enemy drone off of a ship, you would put that ship on high alert. They, they would be paying attention to their yep. radars. They would be, yep. they'd be eyes awake, they, you know, their coffee's in, They're, they know something is afoot. I personally believe, and some other people that I've seen that have done simulations believe, this was a cold fire. Like, they just fired these two missiles. There was no heads up. And because, you know, like I said, we're about two months into this. Um, so because you had sailors who have literally just been dealing with nothing but rough seas for, you know, maybe over 30 or 35 days, they point. were fatigued. They, they weren't paying attention. And so yeah. these things came in and blindsided them. And I would doubt if they even had you know, a moment's notice before the, the alarms would have started to go off when they picked up the, uh, the incoming radar from those missiles. They, they might have had no more than two minutes, 60 seconds, to uh, yeah. figure out what was going on and try to react. And clearly, they didn't have uh, any type of reaction time there whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, I, think you, I think you're exactly right. I think that this was likely a cold fire. Uh, they may not have even done any prep for this or, like you said, had any sort of surveillance over the the ship at the time um and and that's kind of been uh you ukraine is is spread out like that a little bit you've got military groups and you've got people who've literally just been given um uh different forms of rocket launchers yeah mm -hmm. and, and a little bit of training 
and they have really kind of taken that to the, uh, the Russian forces mm -hmm. uh, to help them back. Um, go ahead. No, absolutely. So, yeah, I, what I'd like to do is, is dovetail off that. And we're going to talk about now the patrol boats. So within the last 48 hours, we've gotten reports of the Russians losing two of these these are uh, basically the, they appear to be what would amount to like our coast guard patrol boats but these two patrol boats have now been been sunk separate ones i think they don't, don't have a crew of more than maybe about five mm -hmm. but just to, to talk about rubbing salt in the wound so you've lost your imagine you're the russians you've lost your flagship like it, it is literally sitting at the bottom of the black sea now and uh, a they few try weeks later and then a few <laughs> weeks later you lose two patrol boats to well, a country that does not have a navy to That's a, pretty bad. To a That's, country that does not have a navy. That is pretty bad. Pretty bad. And and just to put into perspective, uh, those those boats, I believe, are around 20 feet. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not 100 percent sure on the exact dimensions, but I, I you know spent a lot of time on boats, and those look to be about 20 footers. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, they're they're not giant boats, but like like Ryan said, they're patrol boats. That their job is for speed and to patrol. Yeah. So. So um, off of that, so we're going to talk now a little bit about uh, Russia's losses in terms of what can't be replaced so easily. So and what I'm referring to, I'm, I called earlier uh, in the clip here, I called it brain drain. But, but really, this is, this is something that I think speaks volumes because a, a tank uh, and an aircraft and a boat, I, I can rebuild that. Um, but what I want to talk about here is, uh, and, and tell me if you're aware of this, is the number of generals and senior staff who have been lost to Ukrainian forces since this combat began. Are, are you aware of this? Yeah. Uh, well, let's just put it this way. The number keeps rising. The, num um, the number does keep rising. Yeah. It, it just keeps rising. So it, you, you'll hear one day that, you know, uh, you know, five generals were lost. I think they lost uh, three generals in one day mm -hmm. on another another. It, it, it's it's uh, you, you don't know. I mean, and frankly, the numbers are kind of hard to uh, follow because of sources. It's hard to be a hundred percent sure from mm -hmm. one source to the next of how many generals are being lost. But we do know one thing is for sure: they're losing generals. The generals are being put to the front lines. Their soldiers are not very good at taking orders unless their generals are right there to bark them at. So uh, this has really kind of put uh, Russia. On, uh, on their heels mm -hmm. uh, they are like you said like you said planes tanks these things can be replaced we we can build this we we can do that a 30 year veteran cannot be replaced that is not somebody you can't you, you can't teach 30 years of combat to somebody or 30 mm -hmm. years of anything mm -hmm. so um I, I think it says a lot about where they're placing their generals um for one uh their their generals are being placed very close to the front uh, in some instances, they're being placed directly on the front. Mm -hmm. And this is what's led to a lot of uh, loss of life on generals uh, specifically. Um, that, that's, that's not going to do them any, any good. That's not going to do Russia any good, but it's going to do Ukraine a, a hell of a lot of good. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you brought up sources. Here in a few moments, I'm going um, to give my sources, and of course, links will be down in the description below. But um, no, I, I, I want to tell you what information I've been able to gather. So it would, it would appear that confirmed, at least confirmed in that these are consistent, consistent numbers that I'm hearing over and over again, is that we know that we have at least eight generals. These are high ranking generals um, of the Russian military who have now been killed in action. So that mm -hmm. number is eight. And I've heard as high as maybe 12 or maybe 10, but that yep. doesn't seem to be the confirmed number. The confirmed number is at least we have lost eight generals um, from Russia. And uh, as you mentioned, these are assets that Russia cannot produce. Um, these are people with an entire career of military, military dogma and doctrine. Um, they know how the Russian forces work, at least they know how they ought to work, even if they're not functioning uh, clearly in their highest um, efficiency. And uh, these, these are the people who are the, the shot callers, right? These are the people who sh are, are given the task of making the decision and as we start to deplete um, this and that, that brain drain, you're now just going to be promoting people who have no idea what's going on. And, uh, you know, I don't know about anyone else, but if you work in a place where experience really ma you know, makes a difference, you know, you can't learn the job in, in 24 or 48 hours. The job takes, you know, years to master. These are people who there is no replacing. Um, that's my point. There is no replacing. Now, I've also heard numbers that as many as 200 senior staff members 
have have been lost. So I don't know how you define senior staff, but this just goes to show that a lot of of Russia's best and brightest uh, are no longer going to be part of that military in, into the future because they have they have been removed from action. Yeah, and, and something else that we have to also keep in mind here is that these generals, if you want to put a word like fanatic on them or just true believers, these are the people who are barking the orders. These are the ones mm-hmm. that will lead orders. Yep. So you're going to have, you, you've got to have these individuals, these generals who truly believe in these orders or at least are, at least have a, 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 a reason to follow them. Uh, beyond uh, your average soldier yep. and they're the ones that are going to encourage their soldiers and push these soldiers forward um, we've already heard of all the issues that they're having on their uh, front lines with soldiers actually following through with with their objectives um, and that's why the generals have been brought to the front so to lose a, your fanatic or, or your true believer whatever you want to call these generals to lose those people and to be and to lead the soldiers who are maybe maybe not true believers mm-hmm. up there by themselves or in the hands of like you said maybe just a five year general mm-hmm. or or even just a ten year general or, or or less to leave them in the hands of someone like that it's got to be uh, uh, terrible for the morale um, uh, and it, it's got to be terrible for their tactics. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned something there about being in the mindset of of the Russians. We're going to save that for a video that we'll do in the future because I think that's a great point and it's worth a deep dive on its own. Um, but yeah, no, those are absolutely fantastic, um, fantastic points you make there. So I I, yeah, I want to take a, a moment, folks, uh, and I want to let you guys know about at least a couple of my, my sources. So links will be in the description down below. Um, so two sources that I found that are wonderful. There's uh, Denny Davilov. Uh, he is actually a, a Ukrainian. He does not speak perfect English, but he does a really good job. Uh, I'm going to leave his link first because I feel like his reporting is very much uh, from the perspective of the Ukrainians reporting. Uh, he talks about things that I didn't didn't even know about. So he, he mentions things in Odessa and ways to defend Odessa j- just didn't didn't even register for me because I've never physically been to Odessa. I had the opportunity, but I didn't go there. The other one's going to be the Enforcer. The Enforcer does these great daily um, live streams, and that's just more than, than the production that I can I can do. So I wanted to leave those. So again, just, um, links for that's going to be down in the description down below. All right, so now let's uh, pivot over to talking about uh, this upcoming holiday. So do you know anything about uh, this holiday from the perspectives of the Russians that's going to be coming up here around May the 9th? Um, as far as what I understand about the holiday, it's not a whole lot, frankly. I think this is going to be a, a, a something uh, that I'm going to be learning about. Mm. One thing I do know um, is that this holiday uh, is kind of marked as, or maybe not kind of, but is marked as uh, ending uh, or, or the defeat of... Nine- we want to be, be careful on our words, so yeah, no, you're good. Back track. What, one, thing I, one thing I do know is that this is essentially the defeat of the German army during World War II mm-hmm. uh, uh, for Ukraine, um, and it's a celebration of that. Um, how, else would I work, how else would you work that? No, I, I think you did a perfect job there, um, absolutely. Okay. And, um, yeah, no, I, that's exactly so. So here in the States, at least back during our parents' generation, we had what was known as victory in Europe and victory in Japan. So two separate days that that were the victory in each of the theaters of World War II. So this holiday seems very similar to Victory in Europe Day for the Americans. It was when, when we knew that, that the war in Europe was over. So this holiday is probably being overblown by us in the West. It's probably going to be glazed over um, over in Russia only because if this holiday was going to be a big deal, they'd be winding this conflict down. And the fact that this conflict is not being wound down, the fact that this special operation, as they like to uh, to call it, is uh, continuing. A very, very special operation. It is a very special <laughs> operation, yeah. The fact that this is continuing tells me that the leadership of Russia maybe didn't anticipate as much pushback, uh, as much stubborn resistance as what they have had to put up with, which I, I just want to, you know, hats off to the, the people of Ukraine um, this is not a, a easy conflict. I'm, I'm going to be showing stills of some of the things that have occurred, you know, but they have really, they, they haven't put down and given up. They have not rolled over uh, and gone belly up by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, I don't know if the Russian leadership anticipated that. 
I, I think it, I think it really has been um, something that other countries can kind of look look towards, um, and and this this can go into uh, other other conversations. There's all kinds of conflicts all over the world and future conflicts that people are worried about, but really the um, men of Ukraine uh, they really really uh, you know stepped up to the plate on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, they they were told. To and fight for their country and they did just that mm-hmm. uh, they stayed and they didn't just fight um, but I mean they're, they're they fought hard uh, and they're continuing to fight hard I don't see I, I, I do not see them ever stopping this fight so it's not going to be something I see Russia doing very well with uh, if they want to continue to push forward I, I can't, you know, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to take another step further. Maybe you haven't heard about this. I want to get your reaction to this. So have you heard about, um, Putin's, Putin's health concerns and his upcoming surgery? Surgery, surgery. Okay. So what, uh, no, I have not. Um, <laughs> okay. Tell me about Putin's surgery. What, what's going on here? So, and again, a lot of these reports can be all over the place. So, you know, we're just trying to distill down the information that we can get that seems to be reliable. Um, but, uh, and of course, the Kremlin is 100% in deception mode right now. Um, right, right. But um, there, are, there are definitely some, some concerns people have noticed with Putin and his health. Uh, a particular one is that he may be, and I'm not trying to be a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not, in no place to speak to this. This is 100% conjecture and opinion. Mm. But Putin, Putin may have some health concerns. He is 68 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he seems to be kind of, well, let's say, uh, a little more swollen than he was maybe just 10 years ago, which may indicate that he's on something like steroids, which usually steroids are used for someone if they have cancer to suppress um, some of the imu- immuno response, um, no depending way. on the cocktail of, of things they're taking. And apparently the headline news here is that he will be going under the knife potentially for mm-hmm. either removal of thyroid cancer or abdominal cancer we don't no know which one way no way that is crazy that's that's crazy so i have not heard of that mm-hmm. um that is that is just interesting you know it's really you know what's really crazy so i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be devil's advocate here and mm-hmm. i'm gonna wonder a which one would it be or b is this some sort of uh deflection is this something going on inside mm-hmm. of the, the, the Russian, um, you know, arm, not army, but I, I guess leadership? The leadership structure, yeah. No. I, I don't know, but that is wild, going under the knife. Okay, under the knife. Putin under the knife. Whoa, that's <laughs> that surgery. He's going, he's going in for surgery. That is insane. Okay, well, um, so, you know, I did hear that he was having issues with his health. I did hear that, uh, but that is that's 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 shocking that's shocking what else do you know about it well so here the plot's going to thicken a little bit on this one because the the sources of information um have stated that when so putin has already kind of have lit has lit his government no and i think you brought up a great point saying the the leadership may be in a little bit of a shuffle well ugh, if there was going to be an opportunity for a shuffle i can't think of a of a more golden window but i'm, I'm just know. gonna you know throw that out there but yeah what's fascinating about this is that when putin so putin's going to relinquish command of the nuclear coats which he has been really beating that drum really hard and we can talk about that in another video but he's going to be relinquishing um the the nuclear authorization not to the the succession so this is not you know, he's the there's the prime minister and the president they have both roles in russia and if he's the president, he should be relinquishing all power to the prime minister, uh, which is a different person than the military person that he's going to relinquish control to. So he is he is opting for a general that has served with him and is probably one of his yes men, That's as opposed to yes the normal constitutional flow of of power with you know according to the Russian constitution. That that is interesting, and that I think that may speak to some things that are kind of under the surface. And I want to say, so I think this speaks to one, one undeniable fact, which is that, that Russia completely thought that this was going to be a um, Afghanistan U.S. removal 2.0. So, you know, when, when we left Afghanistan, we believed that the, the, the um, government power that was there was going to 
hold the line. They didn't. Mm-hmm. They just immediately put down, um, put down, you know, anything. They stopped being belligerent and they uh, allowed themselves to be rolled over. Um, yeah. I think that that Russia, the Kremlin, uh, anticipated that with their uh, their moves, their belligerence onto Ukraine, and um, clearly they thought it was going to be done by now. Because a surgery, especially for something like a cancer, that's an elective surgery. That is not a surgery that is an emergency surgery. That um, is true. That, that is, is something true. that's planned and known, and you set a date for that. Wow, that is good insight. That's true. That's true. Okay, so so you're right. That, that really kind of paints a totally different picture uh, when it comes to the surgery. So you, you're right. I mean, he's probably been aware that this is something that's going to come up. Um, you, you, what do you, I mean, is this like a dying wish or, I mean, it, it, it makes yeah, you almost right? wonder. It does make you wonder. You almost wonder what was the purpose of going into Ukraine on this timely fashion mm-hmm. with knowing that he's going to be going into a surgery, like you said, an elective surgery. That, that is interesting, Ryan. That is interesting. Good. That's a, that's some good points there. Good points. Yeah, well, I mean, I hope that's just something that that um, the viewers can can walk away with, and just something to think about, just mull over, you know, as you as you kind of think about what what's going on here, and really who who would have known, right? Who, who's really in uh, in control here? I, I've I've got some opinions, but I'm not going to name anything. But it seems that certain people who thought they were in control maybe aren't as in as much control as they would like, and other parties who maybe maybe they didn't have a lot of faith in their ability to control the situation seem to be controlling it very well. Um, so I, I, we just got one more point uh, here, and I want to thank everyone for sticking through to this. And, and I think we're gonna gl- we might just kind of glance over this one. Just we're we'll talking about it, but maybe we'll save the meat and potatoes for the we next video. We don't glance. <laughs> we don't glance. What are you talking about? All right. So so that brings me uh, to the last thing I wanted to talk about, which I think is pretty earth shattering news, uh, especially you know we're, when we get this video out. Um, th- this is going to be pretty much on the heels right after that holiday. So. Finland and Sweden are not members of NATO. And a lot of people might be shocked to hear that. So Finland and and Sweden are two northern European countries. Um, They are very close to Russia. Uh, Sweden is is an economic powerhouse for reasons that you may want to fact check. You may just want to look at what what exports that Sweden, I'm not going to name them uh, here for YouTube reasons and just for being family friendly, but you, you may want to see what exports Sweden does that really keeps their economy afloat because uh, it might be a little, might be a little uh, eye opening. And fin- <laughs> Finland, uh, <laughs> Finland has always wanted to be neutral because of the fear. They share a huge border with with Russia, and they have had conflicts in the past with Russia. So there was always this fear that if Finland uh, joined the North um, American Treaty Organization (NATO), um, if they joined NATO, then then that may be provocation to Russia. Russia may find that as, a, as you know, a, a, a non-friendly nation way too close to the border of Russia, literally sharing a, a massive border. So that's, that's the big news here. Now, I'm going to tell you what I've heard, and you can tell me if you've heard any about this, but Finland and Sweden are expected to jointly declare their designation or their intention, excuse me, whatever that intention may be. We don't have that official declaration mm. yet. And I know that one of the goals is, is that but they want to minimize the amount of time from when they state their intention to when they can actually sign the paper if they choose to sign the paper. Mm, that makes sense. Because they don't want to have that window. Let's say that window's two months. Well, that's two months you could have uh, you know, very grumpy Putin and mm-hmm. a very grumpy army uh, moving in and becoming belligerent t- towards the sovereignty of your nation. So yeah. um, now what's interesting, though, the news that I've heard, this is unconfirmed. So this is a little bit more speculation, but it would be amazing if it happens this quickly, is that Finland may declare intention to join NATO as, as soon as May the 12th. That's right around the corner. That is. It's right around the corner, right after that special holiday for Russia when they uh, declared a victory in Europe. And, um, yeah, pretty much on the heels of that. So you're talking May 9th. A few days later, you've got May 12th. And if my previous information holds up, it's that Finland and Sweden are going to declare simultaneously. So their two governments are working in lockstep. So if Finland declares on the 12th, well, it's logical to believe that Sweden is also going to declare their intentions on the 12th. Right, right. That is, that would make sense, yeah. 
And so, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Well, we could be looking at, we could be on the precipice of one of the largest shifts in this alliance in decades, really, it, probably in, in most of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, taking over, including small countries like the ones in the Balkans and some of these other areas don't really bring quite the same balanced, um, a, a balanced allegiance as bringing in a country like Finland, um, which has a, a really interesting culture and has always kind of had this fear of a large conflict hanging over their head. They've always had this in the back of their mind. And then a country like Sweden, which again, I highly suggest you look up what, uh, what makes them an economic powerhouse because what they will bring to this alliance, to the NATO alliance, in terms of economic production and military intelligence alone will be a game changer in and of itself. That's wow. going to be huge. Yeah. Going to be huge. And you know what? You know what? Would you mention in all this? What mm -hmm. it makes me think of is the timing. Yes. The timing right around this elective surgery, which we are all there's like you know, obviously we have uh, intelligence and we mm -hmm. have really good intelligence. Clearly, um, <laughs> clearly we have really good yep. intelligence. Yep. So I'm wondering how long they've known about this and how long they've been discussing the timing of this mm -hmm. uh, and, and the potential. I mean, if, if I knew I was about to go into surgery, I don't think I would do anything too crazy the days before. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So I, I think that this is a very well thought out, very good plan as far as timing is concerned. Uh, it couldn't get any better on timing for them. Yeah. So, so the, the last things, and I think we, we could probably pick this up in a later video. So I'm just going to throw these out there for the viewer to, to mellow on or to consider is ha, has this gone according to plan for, for Russia? And <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. I, I want, you know, I want the viewers to just kind of mellow on this and take the, the opinion. Cause like I said, on our next video, we're going to talk about things from the perspective of, of a, a Russian, you know, man, um, serviceman. So, you know, on this one, has this gone according to plan? And there's a quote that, that comes to mind, and it's wars may, or excuse me, conflicts, conflicts may start when a leader decides, but these conflicts rarely ends, rarely end when that leader wants them to end. Very good. That's, that's a good ending. I think, I think my sign out on that is going to be what plan? What plan indeed, what, right? What, what plan, Putin? What uh, plan? <laughs> well, look, hey, uh, Flight Sim crew, thank you so much for sticking around. This has been your pilot in command, uh, Ryan. And um, you know, just let me know what your what your thoughts are. You know, what, what are you thinking? How are you feeling about this conversation? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this content, go ahead and give me a, a like. Or give this video a like to let the uh, algorithm... Let them know, bless that YouTube algorithm. It makes a huge difference. Um, share this video if you feel like sharing it. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you in the next video. And it makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely.